everyone. I'm Jeff Morgenthaler with Equipment Zone. I'm here with Roy Huseman. Hi, how are you? One of our lead techs. I'm also here with uh, Jay Bissell, who you will not see, but he's working in the background. You'll probably hear him uh, make some funny little comments here and there, but uh, we're going to try to stay on topic because we have a lot of information to cover. We have a lot of people who tuned in because this is a great topic. Something that comes up all the time, every time we talk about directed garment printing. You've probably heard us talk in other webinars about the secret sauce or the formula for a perfect print, okay? This is a very key aspect of that formula, talking about pre-treating. Now I wanna make it clear, this is not an infomercial about the Speed Treater TX by Equipment Zone, the perfect pre-treat machine <laughs> that you should purchase. It's not an infomercial for that. <laughs> So, but we will talk about it a little bit. If you have specific questions about your pre-treater, about maintenance, operation, Roy is happy to talk to you about that offline. You can call in, you can email in, and we'll get in touch with you about that. Make sure you open a tech ticket at our office, and then you can have one of us get back to you on that. That's right. So just so we're clear, we won't be talking specifically about the Speed Treater TX, the perfect pre-treater, but you will see it in the video since that's what we sell. That's what we actually manufacture in New Jersey. And, and that's what we have here in our shop. So today we're going to talk about five different key elements of pre-treating. One is the different pre-treat brands. So we're going to cover those and we're going to talk about what we like and dislike and, and what are some of the different things that you'll witness when using them. We're also going to talk about the application method pre-treating different blends, different substrates. Um, we'll talk about the different t-shirts, sweatshirts, those type of things. We'll get into proper curing and we'll talk about cost, okay? So I'm going to uh, stop talking so we can get into the meat of this. Oh, uh, one more thing. If you have questions, make sure you put them in the questions and answers section of the webinar. That way, if we can't get to it during this, because you know we have limited time, then we can follow up with you later. If you put your question into the chat, that doesn't roll over when we save this and we go look at it later. So what happens when we do these webinars is we get questions in both. If you have a specific question that you want to address, make sure you put it in the questions section of the webinar, okay? Also include your email in case you didn't sign up with your email. Yes, it's easier for us to get back to you. Uh, and then uh, if you have a really great question that is specific to something that we're working on and we can squeeze it in while we're talking about it, Jay's going to put that up for us and then we'll try to address it. So I'm going to turn the time over to Roy and he's going to, going to jump in and talk about different pre-treat brands. Okay, well the major brands that are out there is Epson, Image Armor, and Firebird. Uh, the Image Armor and Firebird are a pre-mixed, ready-to-use product. And the Epson, the one key thing with the Epson is that you want to make sure if you do get the large container, we sell it in smaller one gallons that's easier to manage because this thing full is about 60 pounds. Make sure you can see me. I can see you. But you want to make sure that you now shape this. Here, I'll put it up here. This one's almost empty. You want to make sure that you shake this on the ground for at least a few minutes before you mix solution to make sure everything's mixed back into solution. And the standard mixtures are basically a one-to-one, -one, which is best to start out with. And then as you get more experience with pre-treating, you can mix it one to two or even go beyond that. Um, to two parts water or three parts water to one part solution. Um, the one thing with the Epson that I tend to like better than some of the other manufacturers is there's minimal staining on the Epson product as far as like a frame around the fabric. Now there's going to be some fabrics that are automatically just with the heat of the press is going to change the color of the fabric without even pre-treat on it. So keep that in mind when you're testing and picking the types of shirts that you're going to be ordering. Then there's other products that tend to crystallize and leave a little bit of a white or gray film on that. 
closer. Okay, sure. I don't know if you could see that. That's good. But some of this stuff is hard to see. I'm sure you've experienced that. The one thing I do know, I'm not as familiar with Firebird on the, the dark pre-treat that they have. Um, that's the one thing with the Image Armor and Firebird both, is they both have a light and dark product. Uh, I know with the Image Armor Dark, that a lot of people aren't aware of is that you can mix it with distilled water up to one to one. Uh, you can try with uh, small samples of a lower mixture of maybe uh, half water to two parts solution and start with something like that to try to get rid of some of the uh, staining and picture framing that you get on some of the colored garments. The other thing is uh, we were talking about applications. When you're applying it via a pre-treat machine, uh, a Wagner sprayer, um, which would be this big device here. The one thing I don't like about this is it's a very powerful sprayer. You gotta do it outside and it does create a lot of excess mist and it's hard to control the amount of pre-treat that you're putting on to the shirt. Face mask and protective gear is required. But if you're going up and down and doing it in a pattern like this, or going from left to right, you turn your uh, fan blade to where you're like this direction, and you're going left to right versus fan blade this way up and down. It is hard to control. A lot of people either put too much on or not enough. So. Roy, I just wanted to ask real quick. Um, you recently experienced this at somebody, you went to train somebody mm -hmm. uh, and they were using this. And what was your experience? Well, she actually put a nail on the wall in her room that she had her equipment and she had put all the shirts on a hanger. It was just spraying the shirt and it was spraying all over the wall. So this is a product that's gonna create a sticky mess on the wall and uh, be hard to clean up. Not only that, but if you have children around, it's not something that you want vapors uh, going around in your home. And you, you definitely don't want that to get into your printer. Exactly. And if that's going on your wall, then that also means it's not going on a shirt and you're yeah. wasting it. Exactly. What, what tends to happen is you end up spending twice as much uh, pre-treat on a shirt to get the ample amount than you would if you just used a pre-treat at your start. So, the ROI is why buy this when you can just go ahead and get a free treat. I would like to just add um, from a salesman point of view, I get asked about this a lot. And um, there are people who just don't have the out of pocket money up front for a pre treat machine. So I tell them this is the next best method to use. Mm -hmm. Almost everyone without exception within six months buys a pre treat machine. Now, before I proceed further on this section, I'd like to have Jay bring up a slide on using a light pre-treat versus a dark pre-treat. What designates the reason why you want to do that? Basically, I always tell customers, if you're going to put a white base down, you must use a dark pre-treat, okay? If you're not going to put the white base down, use the light pre-treat. And the reason why is because different manufacturers of shirts are going to have different results. And I have a slide here that's going to show one shirt that printed okay. It still was a little bit lighter, less vibrant on the, uh, the image than the dark pre-treat, side-by-side -side comparison. Both of them were printed at the same exact time on the printer. Both white bases went down at the same time. And then I had another manufacturer where completely the white base kind of penetrated into the fabric and you didn't have that density. I don't know if you could see that on the screen. Are you bringing that up? Okay. And now we'll come back to the pre-treat methods. All right. We got it. So we talked about the Wagner. We talked about a pre-treat machine. Uh, there's also some myths out there. I always have customers that say, oh, I've been on YouTube and 
and people told me to do this or told me to do that. And it turns out if someone ever starts a YouTube video as how I solved this issue, there's no way to solve a problem. You need to just get move away to a different product as far as a shirt manufacturer because it's not going to work for DTG or stick with a certain system to where you have consistency. At the end of the day, you're manufacturing a product and you want to be able to go from pre-treat to cure to print back to cure and be done with it. You don't need to be over here messing around with a shirt all the time trying to get it to print good or changing settings in the DTG and maximizing ink, which costs you more money to do the same thing. So basically one of the myths is, should I use a paint roller or a paint brush when I'm applying my pre-treat? Uh, anything that adds time or possibly moves good amount of pre-treat from one area to an area that doesn't have enough, that would require a situation where you're not applying it properly. You need to maintain your machine. But in essence, you could end up moving it. Yeah, but then you have less on this side. And when you use a brush or a paint roller, you're also lifting up solution into that brush and into that roller when you're doing that application. If you insist on doing something like that, you can buy a burnishing roller. It's a hard rubber or a hard plastic roller, and you just roll and it will push the solution into the shirt rather than picking it up and displacing it. Yeah, I would just like to add, Roy, that when I first got into printing white ink on, on shirts mm -hmm. through a direct garment printer, this was a method that was taught to me over 10 years ago mm -hmm. because we didn't have pre-treat machines and we didn't use power Wagner sprayers and this was the best option at the time. And what I found was that it, it created a tremendous amount of waste that would build up in the brush mm -hmm. and that uh, and then it would be very inconsistent and no matter how much I roll it on that shirt would bunch up and then there'd be little gaps and I, and I wouldn't even notice it until I print and then you ruin your print you ruin your shirt and it's just more waste then you got a brush and a roller yeah. that's going to attract lint you're going to keep using it and you're displacing other stuff you don't want on the shirt so my 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 point on this is that that if you see that online or you've heard that that is old news mm -hmm. And some people just haven't got away from it. Do not do the roll on or the paint on either. You're either going to hand spray it or you're going to use a pre-treat machine, which is your best method. The other thing is, is when you're preparing your shirt, if you're going to look at your shirt after you, I recommend you keep your shirts in your box as well, or in a package or in a, a place that they don't get dirty. Don't leave them out piled up on the ground or the table or what have you. They will attract lint and what have you. If you need to get something off, use a lint roller before pre-treating, okay? You definitely want to do that because you don't want anything to disrupt the fabric after pre-treatment, you know? So you can shake it out, put it on your pre-treater or put it where you're going to pre-treat it. Um, that way you don't have a situation where you're pulling fibers up. The other thing that's out there is people saying, I want to pre-press the shirt prior to pre-treating to push my fibers down. Well, if the fibers are there and you're getting a good spray on your pre-treater, I want my fibers up. So I want solution to totally encompass my fibers. So when I go to the heat press and push those fibers down, they're going to stay down. If I push them down first and I just put pre-treat on top of the fibers, then I'm not going to completely saturate all sides. Unless I over pre-treat obviously and the shirt's soaking wet, which I'm spending too much money. So that's another thing. Plus it's a waste of time, one more step to add, not to say it's going to hurt anything, you know, um, but go ahead. Yeah, so I have, a, I have a quick question. While we're talking about pre-treat method and we're on machines, what makes the difference between a, uh, a great machine, a good machine, and a poor machine? Okay. Now, you've been out there, you've trained people on all different kinds of stuff, so you've seen these in, in different shops. What, what are you looking for in a machine? Well, I think the best machine is one that's going to have a single sprayer, enough pressure to get a single pass on the shirt, and where you can control the amount of solution. 
because if your sprayer does a, one spray back and then it sprays coming forward, there can be pressure changes when that sprayer changes direction in the hoses. So that's one thing that is negative about a machine like that, plus the pump doesn't have enough pressure. Usually that's because the way they design the machine, they have to use a slower, a lower pressure pump, otherwise it'll get burned out because they're trying to divert most of the solution to the nozzle. Versus our machine, where we divert a lot of the solution to the nozzle, but we allow some of it to go back into the bottle to keep that pressure stabilized. And that's a good option for that machine. The other one is having multiple nozzles or people saying, hey, you can shut off a section if you just need to do a logo in the upper right hand chest. Like with our machine, you're going to do the whole span of the shirt, um, but you're going to do how far you're going to go down on the shirt, depending on the design. Now you can get away with doing multiple shirts by folding a shirt in half and then putting another shirt on on the other side. So you can still do the same thing. The thing with multiple nozzles is when you have a nozzle like this and one next to it, you have an overlapped area that's going to get too much pre-treat and then an area that may not get enough. So you always have to make sure that, and it ends up looking like uh, stripes on the shirt where part of it's super wet just to get enough in the areas that it doesn't overlap. So I'm not a fan of those machines out on the market as well. Roy, I just wanted to clarify because you hit a really important part and I, and I just wanted to touch on it again. When you folded that shirt in half and you put it on one side, you can fold another shirt, put it on the other side shorten the the start the starting point of where it starts to spray and then you can hit two left chest logo pre-treats on on two shirts at one time that's correct okay so that's actually faster and better than doing a, a pre-treater that has multiple nozzles exactly okay i just wanted to clarify that yeah, killing two boots with one stuff. it's a close yeah oh yeah and then obviously everything's in close. You don't have all this vapor spraying around. The other thing is keeping in mind when you do set your distance, there is a time lapse between when the pump kicks on and the solution actually spurts out of the nozzle. So always want to go probably about an inch, inch and a half further than you actually want to pre-treat on the shirt on anybody's device because it's still going to take us a little bit of time and as that thing's traveling, the head is traveling, you wanna make sure that you have ample pre-treat. The worst thing is to start printing a shirt and the last quarter inch of that design is not pre-treated properly. The, the last thing I would talk about is if you insist on starting out with something because the investment's not really uh, in your budget at the moment to get a pre-treater, but on your wish list is to try a high pressured sprayer. Okay, this is a squeeze bottle sprayer and it creates pressure as you spray it. Just one second. Here. Yeah, well, well, he is off camera. I'm back on camera. <laughs> and I will say that that sprayer is the same sprayer they use when they cut my hair, which I haven't had done in a while. I've got that Elvis lip going on. Pretty think, soon I'll have the mullet I think Harry noticed too. Yeah, he did. <laughs> But I, I'm only able to trim on the sides because I don't trust anybody in my house to do it. So I think I'm getting a little bit. Anyway, I'm off. I'm done. You're back. So anyway, these sprayers, I've looked online. They're between uh, 7 and $8, depending on how you buy them in packs on eBay or um, on Amazon. So the one thing I have found is at your local Walmart, you can buy a Febreze one that looks just like this for $4.94, but it's filled with Febreze. So you can get another bottle, pour the Febreze in it, and use this uh, for that, and they're easy to pick up. But when I'm squeezing it and it starts to build up pressure, it gives a continuous spray, and it's not like misting way out here like the Wagner does. They create a big mess. This is something you could easily cut out a little cardboard box, have a little table, and just use this sprayer to spray the shirt. The other nice thing is if you are going to do other products later, like hats and shoes, you're going to need a way to pre-treat these. 
So definitely hand sprayer is a great way to do that uh, and a heat gun to dry the pre-treat. The other thing that we're gonna talk about is pre-treating blends, uh, different type of shirts, okay? So you got your obviously 100% cottons, uh, sweatshirts, and different blends of shirts that you're doing. The one thing to keep in mind is DTG technology and washability is very uh, receptive to a cellulose type of fiber. Okay, so when you're doing your research of what products would fall into that, hemp is a cellular fiber. So is bamboo once it's treated, okay? You got cotton. Rayon is also a cellulose fiber. The only thing that isn't is a polyester fiber, okay? And there's different types of polyester, but the, the main one that everybody uses is going to be something like a, um, an Under Armour type of shirt or a Nike type of shirt, a little stretchable, or they even have golf shirts that hang on you. And, you know, they're nice, a Tommy Bahama type of shirt. I mean, obviously the best way to colorize a product like that is dye sublimation, which we also sell equipment, do training in that end of the business. But as far as the hemp, I printed on uh, 60, 40 hemp. So 60 hemp, 40 cotton. Uh, beautiful shirt, uh, feels good, soft to the touch. Uh, as far as sweatshirts, keeping in mind that some of them come with different blends of fabric on the surface that enable you to get a better print when the inside of the sweatshirt may be a polyester product, which is fine too. Just keeping in mind each manufacturer that you're going to try, check with the manufacturer, make sure that it's a DTG friendly product, uh, if you need to call and ask a salesman or, you know, we also sell some sweatshirts, which is great because they're hard to find that print well. Uh, and as far as the uh, t-shirts go and different blends, you got the 80-20s, 70-30s, 60-40s, uh, tri-blends, 50-50s. The one thing that you might see with those and keeping in mind to keep in constant color between the different uh, fibers, whether it be a tri-blend that's got the rayon, poly, and cotton, each manufacturer is going to use a different dye and chemical process. And with tri-blends, there's going to be heat involved. Anytime there's polyester, there's heat and chemicals involved to get that polyester fiber to accept that dye. So with that in mind, some of that is going to displace itself back into the ink when you take it under the heat press and it's wet from pre-treat and it's also wet from the ink and the, uh, the water that is carried with the ink going onto the shirt. So subsequently you wanna make sure that uh, you test those shirts before you buy a lot of them. I do have a sample if uh, when Jay gets a second, he can bring that up on the screen. So my, my big question for you that, that I get from clients, Roy, is whether I'm, I'm looking at a t-shirt or a sweatshirt, let's just start with those two to make this question mm -hmm. simple. How do I know how much pre-treat to put down on either one? Because what I put on a sweatshirt is going to be the amount mm -hmm. of pre-treat I put down will be different than what I put on a t-shirt, correct? Well, typically most people put the technical aspect as you need uh, like 28 grams or 30 some grams of pre-treat on a shirt. But then again, when you start looking at that is, am I pre-treating the whole shirt or am I just doing a small portion? So that throws that aspect out the window. The way I look at it is you wanna have a constant saturation on the surface of the fibers with no modeling and no areas that look like there isn't any coverage. What do you mean by modeling? What do I mean by modeling? Well, basically, that could tend to be certain shirts where you actually have the shirt repelling the pre-treat, okay? Perfect. Where it almost looks like there's spots occurring onto the fabric. Because getting back to what I mentioned before is the dye process and chemical process. Most people aren't aware when you get a shirt, that shirt's going to have the residual dye and chemicals in the fabric 
until you, the customer, or your customer washes it for the first time. And some of that is almost creates a scotch guard effect on the fabric. And some of the shirts that are out there, I know Gildan just released in January, a enzyme wash because their shirts from different places in the country, I mean, they have all over the world manufacturing. So you might get a case from Honduras or El Salvador or Pakistan or whatever, and then have an issue with the, a product. And then you find out it's because it came from a country that used a chemical that's repelling the water. Because this is a water-based process between pre-treat and ink, you need to make sure that cotton is gonna absorb the water and disperse it as it's being cured and, and the printing's going on as, as well. Because that ink, in order for it to set up, you actually have to allow that ink to hit the shirt and the water to absorb into the fabric to allow that ink to start drying, okay, and bonding properly. So let me have uh, Jay pull up a couple slides for you guys real quick. Same. Yep. I think I already showed them. No, you're going to scroll down. Okay. So let's go down to the next one. Um, this is just a light versus a dark free tree. Someone using a dark free tree on a light shirt, it darkens the image a little bit, depending on the manufacturer. Keep going. Keep going. I will show the pictures. Okay. Now this right here is a picture that's showing 100% cotton shirts, different manufacturers. That's another thing to keep in mind. When you're looking at the fabric, the flatter the fabric, the better the print. You're, you're dealing with a canvas that you're going to start with. So if I have a very tight weave, a very flat surface, I'm going to, number one, less pre-treat and number two, less ink. We did a seminar uh, a few days ago with the garment creator and some of these shirts that have a very thick weave where you could see the, the ink isn't, a, isn't adhering properly on some of these, if you look at the white base towards the top, you can see one shirt has a nice base where it looks like I took a paintbrush and painted the white ink on and the other ones are allowing the fabric to show through. And in order to, to get a better shirt, all three of those shirts were, were printed with the same basic setting as level three on garment print, okay? In order for me to get more coverage and a better white base, now guess what? I gotta add more ink. And some of these cheaper shirts, uh, you're gonna, by the time you add the pre-treat cost and the extra ink cost to make it look good, you've already spent enough money to buy a better shirt that has a tighter weave to begin with, a more comfortable wearing shirt, something that you'd want to wear, okay? And then the last thing, if you can pull up the last slide there, is that I wanted to talk about uh, ink migration. This is a sample, it doesn't do it justice, but typically when you print a shirt like a tri-blend on the um, DTG, it looks beautiful, you go to cure it, and it looks like if it's a black shirt or whatever the color shirt it is, it's gonna tint the image and reduce the density almost by 50% as soon as you heat press it. And you're gonna like, oh my God, what happened? Well, that's because the, the heat of the heat press reactivated those dyes and they went into the uh, DTG ink as it was curing. A way to try to get around that would be to pre-treat the shirt, cure it, come back, pre-treat it again, same setting, cure it again, because what we're doing is we're blowing steam through that chemicals and you stay, are stabilizing those dyes that are still in the fabric. And then we can go and DTG, print it, bring it over your heat press and you have a hover mode, you hover it for a cure time and then you press it. That is the only way that you're going to get a shirt like that. I had one customer I went out to that had already taken a job on a tri-blend and there was 50 shirts she had to print. And she already committed to the customer. I said, we'll try to make this work. And that was the process we did. And she went ahead and said, I'll never order those shirts again. 
because it was just too much time, too much pre-treat cost, and possibly the customer rejecting the job because it still wasn't a hundred percent. I have a question for you, Roy. Yeah. If you do everything the way you should, you get the right shirts or you pre-treat properly and you cure it, you still see a little bit of a, a box from mm -hmm. where the heat press hit it, yeah. where the pre-treat was. Uh, one, one question that we had that I think fits right here is, does that wash out in the first wash? How does that look after the first yeah. wash? Most shirts, it will wash out. Some shirts, it will not. I can't guarantee that it will. I think it's a matter of you and due diligence and testing those shirts yourself, printing them, taking them home and washing them for the first time then you know what you're telling your customer. Hey, you could also put a card. I've been at customers that have put cards in with the shirt and said, this frame that you see around the fabric where the design is, is a chemical process that we apply to the fabric to give the image longevity. So it gives the customer the sense that, oh, wow, they did something special to the shirt that I got. And once I wash it, it's going to be good. Uh, the salesman line on that is, it's a feature. Yeah. Okay. It's a feature. Spin. J spin room. Yeah. So um, great. Perfectly answered. I would say that of all the shirts that I've printed myself, and I'm not a tech and I'm not an expert, I'm a salesman. Yeah. But all the shirts that I've printed, um, that box has always been minimal before I wash it, and I never see it after. Mm -hmm. That's my personal experience. Yeah. But I'm using ring spun cotton mm -hmm. and some tri blends. Yeah. So like you said, I think it's important to know what shirt you're printing on and, and working with. Cause exactly. that have a different And then there's shirt. also the combed ring spun cotton, which most people don't hear about, which is basically when they take the cotton balls that have been growing and you get seed fragments, where if you've ever looked at some shirts, it almost so looks like there's little knots in the fibers as they, they uh, you know, I guess weave the fabric. But if you look at a comb ring spun, it's perfectly woven, perfectly straight lines, and it's really tight together. And that's really the best type of shirt. And some shirts like that are gonna cost a little bit more, over $3 or right about $3, depends on the volume. If you stick to one or two product lines that you're gonna focus on to start, then you can buy it in a higher volume. I would never recommend allowing a customer to bring in a shirt. And this is just from a technical standpoint and having customers call and say, Hey, you know, someone gave me 50 shirts and I just ruined two. How do I fix this problem? They're not printing right. So with the testing involved, making sure you have the right products and understand the products at the end of the day, I want to be able to take a shirt from pre-treat here to the machine here and put it in a bag and get it out or put it in a box and have it ready for my customer to pick up with no headaches whatsoever. We're manufacturing a product. The more consistent we are with what we do, the better we're going to be. And that way we're not sitting here trying to figure out how to solve problems that we have in house when the easiest way to do that is to get rid of the product that we're using and go to something that's going to work. Because every manufacturer, I can name off every brand of shirt out there and all of them have shirts that work and all of them have shirts that don't so make sure that you test your shirts before you say hey i'm going to offer sweatshirts buy a couple with your order test them take them home wash them go to and our then, website yeah, yeah. or roy, give us a call roy we're getting a lot of questions about how far in advance can i pre-treat before printing and, and you know if it's a length of time how do i store those Okay, basically, if, you, if I pre-treat a shirt, cure it, and it's completely dry, so I want to let it completely dry, because sometimes the outer edge may have some moisture, I can put those back in a box and store those for up to a year. You want to keep them out of UV light, and keeping them in a box is also going to keep dust off of them and lint off of them. Now, I've heard that you need to, when you stack those, you... You put the pre-treated faces next to each other and then the backs next to each other. You alternate that to keep the, matter. oh, okay. No, it doesn't matter. Well, we don't do that spell that when we pre-treat for shows. We just stack them straight up. So when we're pulling them off, everything on the top is, is pre-treated. And then do I, do I heat press it again before I print? 
Yes, you do. You're also going to heat press again, depending on where you're at in the country. If you're, uh, you know, Virginia, middle of the summer, or yes. let's take uh, Louisiana. Anywhere but Arizona? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anywhere but in Arizona. And you're running at 75 degree or 75% humidity or more. There's also could be issues with DTG. The ink isn't going to lay down straight, okay, or right. Uh, the other thing is cotton wicks moisture. So a matter of four or five hours, this shirt's going to get wet again. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to throw it into the heat press for 10 to 15 seconds, especially if it's been left overnight. Give it a good pressing and get that excess moisture out of the shirt. Because the key thing is, is I want a completely dry shirt and that goes with proper cure times, which is what we're going to be talking about right now. There's a lot of people out there that say, oh, well, I crank up my, my temperature and I cure for 30 seconds on a high pressure. Well, that's okay if they're using uh, parchment paper and then you get people that are using Teflon sheets. A Teflon sheet doesn't allow the water to, to evac or to wick out off the shirt and start the drying process. It actually holds that moisture right on the fabric. If you ever pull a heat press up, you pull your Teflon sheet up and it's got moisture all over it, then that means that shirt isn't being cured pro properly. The, the thing you want to make sure is when my shirt is cured, that I have a nice, stiff, flat, and dry surface. If it feels sticky or where it's grabbing onto my hand, where if I touch it, then that means that I'm not cured properly. And the key thing is, is when my ink hits my fabric, especially if I'm printing with a white base, I need my white base to start setting up and drying. If that doesn't happen fast enough for my colors to go on top, then I'm going to not get the vibrancy and color that I expect because that color is going to hit wet ink. Okay, so really key, it's like a sponge. If my sponge has water in it and I go to wipe up more water, it's not going to work. I got to wring that sponge out in order to wick up any moisture when I'm picking something up. Same with the shirt. I got to be able to pull that water out of that ink when it's applied to the shirt during the printing process. Go ahead, Jay. What about leaving the t-shirt overnight without curing it on the heat press? Like you can do that too. You can uh, put them on hangers or put them on a table, racks, whatever you want to do and leave them overnight. The only thing is, is prior to printing, 10 to 15 seconds again to pull any excess moisture out of the shirt and make sure it's completely uh, the fibers are flat and everything as well as when you get to uh, get ready to print on okay and, and along with that air dry just letting it sit overnight we could um, also put it through a conveyor dryer if we're oh, using yeah. that with our printing exactly process. and conveyor dryer is great to have for curing it gives the shirt a better look it can speed up the process and then as far as pre-treat Keep in mind, you can conveyor dryer, but you still need the heat press to flatten that shirt out before printing, okay? Can and the you... reason is because you have a, a platen height issue and a focus, you know, focus is basically a layman's term for that, is if my shirt has to go lower because it's puffy and it's not laying completely flat, I could have an issue with the quality and sharpness of my print. So I want to flatten my surface so when I get it on my platen, whatever platen you're using, to get a nice flat surface to where I can have my platen as high as it needs to go to get a nice crisp image. So before we get into our last topic, um, Roy, I want to ask you, can you pre-treat a shirt here on the camera and then get into the cost of that and, and what the settings are Mm -hmm. for how much you put down on that shirt. Yeah. So basically using a speed treater, uh, depending on the, the, the brand of the shirt, the smoother the surface, you can experiment with lower settings. So I'm basically applying my shirt onto the platen here, and I can move the camera to get you guys a better view of that. How's that view? Perfect. Okay. 
the one thing to keep in mind is usually your images are going to start up at the upper part of the uh, shirt. I always want to make sure that I'm pre-treating all the way to my collar. So I know if I start that image one inch down, three quarters, or one and a half inches, or wherever it's going to be, is that I know I got ample pre-treat above that where that image start point is going to be. Obviously, when you put it on your uh, DTG, you may position it a little bit differently, but you always want your pre-treat coming up to the top of your shirt. And then you're going to tuck your shirt in and have it ready. You're going to set your distance right here. I got mine that's set at 17 and a half on my, this specific one that we have here. Um, and that's going to give me a 16 inch uh, coverage area by the width. Okay. You just got to fix the camera real quick. The better. Okay, go down a little bit. Okay. 16 inch coverage area. And that way, when I go to my 14, 16 flatten on my DTG, I know I got enough coverage that I could print a full size image. Okay. So basically, I'm just going to shut the drawer on the end. This shirt right here, uh, typically we run most t-shirts on our machine between a four and a half and five. If you're running any loose weave products or a heavy weave product, I'm going to go at least five, if not closer to five and a half, and really saturate that fabric. Because if you look at it with a magnifying glass, if I have hills and valleys in there with the looser weave, I got to cover all that with pre-treat and I got to cover all that with ink. So keeping that in mind, got to start out with the right pre-treat first and then you go with the ink secondary. So once I push that in, our machine takes a few seconds um, to pre-treat the shirt. And I have, which you really can't see here, but my pre-treat starts right about here. It see. covers to the edge and comes all the way up to the top edge right here. And I have a nice consistent coverage across the shirt. There's no modeling. There's no stripes or areas that it didn't cover. Again, keeping your machine maintained, making sure your nozzles are clean and that you're getting an even spray. If my nozzle's shooting out like I put my finger over my garden hose, then I got a problem because it's not going to be consistently laying down that free tree. And from here, proper curing. I like to not go back and forth as far as uh, temperatures, times, and pressures. So I'm pretty consistent with going with 90 seconds for my pre tree on a lighter pressure. Okay. And again, I want to make sure my collar is right up to the edge of my flatten. So I'm getting a cure all the way up to the lead edge. Putting my parchment paper down, which allows it to wick out properly. And you'll see some steam as soon as I uh, brought that down. Well, that's uh, pre-treating. I have a question for you, Roy. You, use, you just mentioned the uh, parchment paper uh -huh. and um, I know a lot of people ask me about, can I use my Teflon cover that I have on my heat press? Will that work? I just talked about that at the beginning and Teflon sheets do not allow the moisture to wick out. Okay, good. The, just wanted to The paper recover. allows the moisture to wick out. And as soon as I'm done here, I can actually take my paper off. It's going to be dry where the shirt was, but all the outer perimeter is going to be wet because it pulled that moisture out and it's still on the parchment paper. Okay. Now, I can reuse these sheets. A lot of people ask because they think they can, you know, have to throw it away every time. If you're doing an ample amount of pre-treat on that shirt, the more you put on it, the more, the less you could reuse it. So I typically get between three and six uses out of a, a sheet. And the thing is, is once it's done, you want to lay it onto a flat surface, okay? That's the key thing. If you lay it on a flat surface as the parchment paper is pulling down, it's not going to get all wrinkled and you could reuse it. As soon as it gets wrinkles that displace into the fabric, then you want to throw it away and start with a new sheet. And I don't recommend that you, so basically it's hard to see, 
but along this edge right here is completely wet with moisture. You can see the wrinkles, yeah. You can yeah. See so, and this part is flat, as I mentioned. So if I lay this flat right now as it's cooling off, then I can reuse it again. And that means my shirt's going to be nice and flat as well as far as the surface. If I reuse a sheet and it had a few wrinkles in it and I get wrinkles in the shirt, as long as they're not deep wrinkles and they're just surface, that's okay. If they're deep, grab the shirt, stretch it out, get a new sheet, and then pre-press it again for at least 30 seconds. And that will get rid of those wrinkles enough. You might see them faintly in there, but they're not going to ruin the job when you go to print. Awesome, awesome news. I, I have to ask a question okay. because somebody asked this and I've never been asked it before. So okay. I'm gonna throw you on the spot. I've never, never even thought of this. Can you take a pre-treated group of pre-treated shirts and throw them in a dryer to dry them? Will that work? No. Okay, there you go. Question answered. <laughs> and the reason is because when are you going to do that? When it's still wet? Are you going to stack the shirts wet on top of each other? When the pre-treat is wet, each shirt has to be individual when they're drying. On hangers, what have you. Uh, if you have these shirts that are wet everywhere and I throw them and bunch them together, that moisture is going to get displaced on other things or the pre-treat itself. It almost gets back to, hey, I'm going to use a roller or a paintbrush. So I'm going to end up having pre-treat on different parts of my shirt when I'm doing that. Now, if the shirts are mainly dry, you don't need to throw them in a dryer because you still got to heat press them to get that residual moisture for 10 to 15 seconds. So again, it's really a moot point. Um, and, and then if you could just talk to us about the cost to do that. So typically if I'm doing a full image, uh, 14, 16 on the standard platen, you're probably looking at about a cost of 20 to 25 cents, depending on the shirt. Now, if you're having to double pre-treat it because it's a shirt you're trying to get a better image on, then ultimately that's going to be more money or twice as much. Okay, perfect. Um, a couple of questions and um, I just, this just came up. Of, of the three different pre-treat solutions that you brought up at the beginning, you brought up Epson, mm -hmm. you talked about Image Armor, mm -hmm. and you talked about Firebird. Yeah. Which one do you recommend over all of them? Well, to be perfectly honest with you, on dark garments, I like I like Epson the best, and the reason is because it's 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 a solution that you're mixing with water already, and it tends to discolor or cause the framing less, okay, than some of the other ones that are pre-mixed that tend to crystallize more, where it almost looks like it's giving a slight little a hint of a heather look onto the area where the pre-treat is, like it's crystallizing. Okay, okay, so you, you prefer the Epson, but Image Armor makes um, one called Ultra that we have used for dark shirts mm -hmm. and one for light, for light colored shirts. Can you use the Epson pre-treat and mix it so that it works on light? Well, you can, but it's, it's, it depends on the mixture. Obviously, you need to do some testing and what have you. So it's just a matter of trial and error. On and that. dial that in and properly. And dial it in. It depends on the manufacturer shirt you're going with, how strong you want to make that, because you want to definitely make sure you're not getting any stain. Okay. But the other two manufacturers have a product that is already pre-mixed, and it is slightly different than the dark pre-treat product one. So and, and I wanted to point out, earlier when you were showing, if you could grab that box again of the Epson pre-treat, mm -hmm. Um, the reason we showed you this is because last year, this was a, a, a special that Epson did. They gave that away with every printer. Um, but now what we found is that it is easier to, um, that we, we divide that up into smaller containers for shipping and for you to be able to, to handle that in your shop as far as mixing and keeping it agitated properly. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, Jay has a question. Well, we've had a lot of uh, questions about 
time and temperature. Is there a time for pre-treatment on the heat press? Is mm -hmm. there a setting of pressure? Yeah. What are your recommendations? Okay. Well, basically the, the, the norm is 30 to 45 seconds at heavy pressure, okay? Which to me, getting back to moisture again and humidity as we talked about, if I'm in Louisiana and I got a humid environment, it's gonna take more time for my shirt to be cured. As I mentioned, at the end of the day, what you're looking for is the shirt to be completely dry, completely smooth and stiff to the touch. That's the optimal curing for a shirt. If it feels sticky, moist, you're not cured it long enough. I mean, you gotta keep in mind, if I don't get this water out of the shirt, then I could have issues when I go to print DTG. Because again, that ink is carried with water and that water needs to absorb into the fabric to allow the ink to start setting up. If that doesn't happen quickly enough, and especially on a dark garment, I put my white base and my white's wet because it's not absorbing the moisture out of it to allow it to dry, then I'm gonna have to put a pause or if I don't put a pause and I go back and put color right on top of it, it's not gonna give me the vibrant print that I'm looking for. So a lot of people make the mistake is go back into the settings of Garment Creator and to increase the amount of ink that is going on the shirt, which raises their cost. And ultimately, if you pile enough ink, ink on there, it's gonna come back and look good, but I just spent unnecessarily um, on that shirt. Okay, let's, um, thank you, Roy, that's perfect. Let's, uh, we're going to answer a couple of more questions that Jay's going to ask from the list, and then uh, we'll wrap it up and then try to um, answer the other questions through email and, and giving you a call. One of the questions that seems to get repeated here is, Oh, wait. <laughs> oh, wait. Yeah, so wait. I just wanted to get back to this. I know cure time on light pressure is 90 seconds on a good heat press. Perfect. So I didn't, I just said it's got to be dry, but go ahead. I'm sorry. So 90 seconds? 90 seconds is what I use because I know it's going to be optimally cured at that point. Could be less. Uh, <clears throat> I just go with 90 because you know what? If I'm doing light shirts, dark shirts, pre-treating, and I don't have to change my time, temperature, or pressure, then that speeds up my production. <clears throat> Where if one person's working between uh, pre-treat or heat press, curing shirts, you can just keep rotating and everything's going to work fine because you don't have to stop and change times and, and all this other stuff. It takes longer to do that than wait a little longer for the item to finish. Several people have noticed that after you have heat pressed the pre-treated shirt, uh -huh. you've rubbed your hands over it. Yeah. Many people were taught not to do that during the training. Okay. I think you're showing it just from the perspective of, see, it's dry, it's crisp. Uh -huh. Once it's right, you should probably take it right to the printer, correct? Well, that depends on the person, actually. Okay. And I'm not going to isolate or um, try to attack a certain individual type of person, but I have very dry hands. Some people have moist hands. I always apply my shirt on the DTG with my hands. I don't use a hockey puck, okay? And it's because I can feel what is going down. Am I gonna displace those fibers if the shirt is pressed properly? It's like I got hairspray on my hair. If I touch my hair, it's okay because the hairspray is gonna hold it. Just like the pre treat is gonna hold those fibers if they're completely dry. Again, at that point, it tells me if there's any moisture in the shirt, my hand's not gonna glide over the surface. And I've printed tons of shirts. I wear them myself and wash them, and I'm getting all the washability. There's no issues with oils on my skin or anything of that nature. So for me, it works. Perfect. Um, is there a perfect temperature setting, the temp setting for the heat press when you're doing pre treatment? Um, basically, I go with 338, anywhere between 340, 338, 336. It depends on the recovery rate of your heat press. The better the heat press, the lower the temp start temperature that you're going to be at. Because as soon as you put a shirt in there, your temperature is dropping down. If you've got a digital uh, heat press, you want to make sure your temperature is at least staying 
at 330 or above. Okay, and that's also for the curing of the ink. So consistency, leaving at a good temperature where I can go from one thing to the next. And, and we're using the DK20A, mm -hmm. the Geo Knight 16 by 20 semi-auto heat press clamshell in yep. case anybody was wondering. Yeah, and actually this one right here, I really like this one because it's got a very wide mouth and allows me to get my shirt in on one fell swoop. So if I'm doing one of these, you know, you get to doing it all day, I can just throw my shirt in there and I'm not futzing around with it, putting my sheet on top of it. I get a good. I like that word futzing. Uh, the question came up, don't I need to thread the shirt onto the heat press? We never do that, right? No, I never do. Not with t-shirts, not with anything. Actually, uh, even for curing, I don't thread anything, okay? Oh, the only time I'm going to thread is when I go to the DTG. Okay. If it's a t-shirt or something really thick, I will thread it to keep my platen high as, as high as I can keep it. Uh, another question, Roy. Why does, and I don't know if you have the answer to this, why does image armor yellow on light fabrics? So people are using image armor and it's yellowing after the pre-treatment. Well, the question is, is it the light yeah, image armor light. or is it the ultra? They yeah. didn't, they, they didn't specific. They said, yeah. why does well, image armor yellow? Typically the light image color? armor light on a light shirt, white shirt is going to discolor uh, via UV rays. So if you wash the shirt, okay, then you're not gonna have an issue. But let's say for instance, I printed a shirt and I went out to the mountains hiking all day in the sun. That shirt's gonna discolor. The or if I go to the ocean and the beach or on this, uh, you know, a little souvenir shop that are printing souvenirs for my customers on the beach, I want to go ahead and make sure that that shirt is washed before it goes into UV light for extended periods of time because it will discolor. If you are hanging shirts in the window of your building for samples for your customers walking by, wash those shirts first. I, you know, put them in the dryer maybe put them on the heat press to get them flat again and go ahead and throw them up there in the window and you're not going to have an issue. Uh, but you definitely want to let your customers know if you're in an environment where they're going to take them outside immediately that you want to let them know that they will discolor for prolonged times in UV rays. Awesome. Thank you, Roy. I'm going to jump back here into the camera and just uh, make sure that uh, you can see us right. Ooh, okay. Can see yeah. Now. There. You can now. Extreme close up. All right. I just want to say thank you to Roy. Um, I know I learned something today. I'm sure you have. We covered a lot of information, so there will be a recording that you can go back and watch this. Don't forget that you can email support at equipmentzone.com. And that's fine if you didn't purchase from us. We answer all of the questions. And somebody will get back to you. If they feel like it's an easy answer in an email, they'll probably respond via email. If it's a longer discussion and they need to call, then Roy or Omar one or, or Joey, text. one of the other techs will give you a call. So thank you, Roy. That was fantastic. Thank you, Jay, for working behind the scenes to which this could not have been possible. He does an amazing job of setting this up. Previously recorded webinars are available. Previously recorded webinars are available. More webinars are being scheduled. We're working on one about graphics. We have another one for uh, frequently asked questions. Uh, we have one DTG part, three. Yeah. DTG part two. We hope to be printing on masks. We're going to do another live webinar where we print on face masks. Awesome. In case you didn't hear that, printing on face masks. So a lot of good stuff coming up. Again, this was not an infomercial. <laughs> uh, speed Treater TX. Oh, last, treater. last question. One more question. Asked, we're going to squeeze this in. How much is the Speed Treater? Currently, if you go onto our website at equipmentzone.com, or if you email me, jeff.m at equipmentzone.com, you'll find out that, that, that the pre-treater is $27.95 right now on sale. Normally that pre-treater is $4,500. So we have a great special going on. We want to get to that before that goes away. And thank you, Terry Combs, for asking that question. That was Terry? <laughs> All right. That's it. Well, a pleasure talking to you all today. Have a good one. Stay safe out there.